I need to turn off. But okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we're gonna totally change um, change gears. And this week, I guess today, well, starting next week, we'll do randomization tests and bootstrap. And and we're gonna use uh, do statistical inference with computational methods. And so this this lecture, I guess I don't know where everybody's background is in, in stats. Like all of you were supposed to have taken stats ten, and if you didn't take stats ten, you had to have taken AP stats and stuff. But you know, I used to, I did, used to not do this lecture, and I just assumed everybody had a good grasp on stats ten stuff, and then and then later on somebody would be asking like, "What's a p value?" and I'd be like, "No, you can't ask me that." Um, so so anyway, this today's the this lecture is the lecture where I tell you what a p value is, okay? And and so you know, I'm going to be kind of compressing the entirety of stats ten into this one lecture, which just means um, I'm not going to do a very good job. Okay, but we'll do our best and hopefully, hopefully, like, you, because you've seen this before, even if it's been like, whatever, four years since you took it in high school, um, this will at least be a, a bit of a refresher um, for, for it and stuff. So, uh, all right, let's, let's just review um, intro stats. And so, you know, we're, we're going to do descriptive statistics. We talk about um, describing the center and spread and things like that. And we describe the center using the mean and the median. And so conceptually, well, I don't know. I don't know if anybody told you conceptually what the mean and the median is versus like the mean is you add the numbers up and you divide by how many you have. And the median is you like sort them and you start at the ends and you go like this until you get to the middle. And, and that's true. That's how you get the mean. But if you think about like why are these values the center, it's because they balance things on the things on one side and things on the other side. So the median will balance the number of points. You're going to have the same number of points on the left as you do on the right. And the mean balances the deviations of the points that are on the left and the points that are on the right. Okay? And so um, and because the mean balances the deviations, which is like how far things are away from it, it gets pulled in directions of skew, right? So if you have outliers super high up, you have huge deviations, and because the mean is trying to balance those deviations, it's going to get pulled in that direction. So here's just a little illustration of what I mean. Um, if you have the one, values 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, and 10, the median is 3.5, right? You've got three points below 3.5, three, three points above 3.5. It balances the number of points on each side of the median. The mean will be this red line and it balances the deviations. So we say, okay, what are the deviations from 5? Well, 10 has a deviation of plus 5 and the other value of 10 has a deviation of plus 5 um, for a total of 10 on the right. And then if you look at the deviations below, you have 4, 3, 2, 1. 4 has a deviation of 1. 3 has a deviation of 2. 2 has a deviation of 3 from the mean of 5. And 1 has a deviation of 4 from 5. So if you add those up, they add up to 10. You add up the ones, ones on the left add up to 10, the ones on the right add up to 10. You've balanced out the deviations. And that's what the mean is doing. You're balancing out these, um, the deviations. Okay, And so, so that's why we end up getting, um, getting that. Okay, um, <clears throat> The variance and standard deviation measure the spread of the values, how spread out the values are, or how similar the values are. And, and this <clears throat> uh, you know, really only applies to numeric variables and stuff. And so uh, small values of variance and standard deviation mean the values are all close together. So the example I like to use is imagine a classroom, a second grade classroom in elementary school. And you ask, how, how old is everybody in this classroom? And when you were in second grade, everybody in your classroom, right, was like seven years old, maybe eight years old, depending, you know, at the start of the school year, everybody was seven, should have been, I think. And then, you know, as, as time went on, you know, the October birthdays turned to eight, and then the November birthdays, and, 
and then maybe at the end June. But if you were an August birthday like me, nobody ever celebrated your birthday in class. So, <laughs> but, um, but uh, you always, yeah. Anyway, so um, so in in a in a elementary school classroom, very small spread, very small standard deviation, very small variance there. But then if you imagine. I guess this would be pre-pandemic. I don't even, have you guys had the experience of going to the DMV and you're sitting in the waiting room and you're looking around and you're just waiting for your number to be called? But what are the range of ages there? It's like huge, right? You've got old people, you've got young people, you've got adults who bring their babies and their children. So you've got like the widespread of ages, you know, you're there when you're 16 to get your driver's license, but you've got everybody else too. and. Uh, so you got a very, very large uh, variance there. And we can think of the variance as the, quote, average square distance from the mean. And then the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And so, you know, this is the formula for variance, 1 over n sum of x i minus x bar quantity squared. And we can think of, if we, if we break this down, we have x i minus x bar. That's the distance from the mean. x i minus x bar quantity squared would be the square distance from the mean. And the average would be, you add these up and you divide by n, that would be the average square distance from the mean. But this thing is biased, right? And then so instead of dividing by 1 over n, you divide by 1 over n minus 1. And this gives you the unbiased estimate of the variance, uh, or the average square root, square distance from the mean. Um, you guys did learn why you do n minus 1 versus n in like 100b? Is that when you do it? or? Like just a few weeks ago, right? I think it's steps ahead. Do they? Maybe? You guys are shrugging your shoulders? You don't remember. Okay. We call, it's called Bessel's correction. The reason why is if we knew the population mean, mu, okay, we would just do uh, x, xi minus mu quantity squared, the distance from the population mean squared. And we would add them up and divide by n, and that would be an unbiased estimate. Okay, it would not be biased. Uh, as you know, as as you get bigger samples and more samples, it's going to hone in on the right right value. But the issue is we don't know what mu is, so we're using x bar, the the mean from your sample, as a guess for what mu is. X bar is an unbiased estimate of mu, but as far as this thing goes, because x bar is based on your sample, it's going to end up being in the center of your sample. And if we're using this to estimate the distance from the mean, it's going to underestimate the distance from the mean because it's always going to be in the middle of your sample, whereas mu might be a little bit off. And so it's going to underestimate. And so turns out dividing by n minus 1 rather than n fixes this, uh, fixes for that. So anyway, that's why you divide by n minus 1. Uh, we learned about the normal distribution. Normal distribution is unimodal and symmetric. That just means values near the middle. Our most common values way above middle, our less common values way below middle, are far less common. And you know, uh, I think you learn the empirical rule, which says around 68%, around two thirds are between one and negative one, 95% are between two and negative two, 99.7% are between three and negative three, right? And more accurately, we have 1.96. Hopefully, these numbers are kind of familiar. We made you memorize these in your intro stats class. All right, and um, and so you know when we ask a, a research question, every research question has some kind of associated population, and the population is is everyone, everyone who's relevant to answering the research question. So. Um, and the problem is, is the population is always too big for us to study it directly. And we might not even know how to identify everyone in the population. That's, it's always, that's always the issue. So, you know, if you have a question, is some, you know, you're, you're working for Big Pharma or something, and you say, hey, is this new drug, is this effective at treating disease JKL? The population would be everybody who has disease JKL. And that is, uh, you know, how, how can we identify this? <laughs> you know, we say big pharma like derisively, but uh, it's only like certain parts of it, right? The profit-making side is the 
the quote unquote evil side of the of the industry. But but we need we need the pharmaceutical industry to make important drugs that save lives and things like that. It's just when they realize, oh, you can make a lot of money off of this, that's that's where we run into ethical questions here. But but the the problem here is we got everybody who has this disease. That's that, that's the group that's relevant to answering this question, and we can't you know we certainly can't study everybody who has it, and we might not even know who has this you know mis mystery disease here. So so you know what do we do instead? Instead of dealing with the population, we have to study a sample. Okay, the sample is going to be a, a selection of individuals drawn from the population. So this big potato is supposed to be the population. This is like everybody. And then here I'm drawing randomly selected arbitrary individuals and they get selected and put into my sample here. Okay. Now the hope, the hope is that our sample, whatever we have here, is like a miniature version. It's a representation of the population. Okay. Um, and if your sample does not look like the population, then the study that you do based on your sample is going to end up not very helpful as far as answering questions about the population. This is why I'm always so wary of people doing like surveys online and you know somebody will say, hey, can I can you fill out my survey? Or they'll put like a Google form up and they say, hey, fill this out. We're just trying to get opinions and it's I always say like how how is this how do you even know the people that respond to your survey are going to be representative of whatever group you're trying to study right and it's just going to be basically you're going to just email your friends who probably are more similar to you than different from you and uh, and you're just going to end up you know getting a sample of echo chamber results and stuff so I don't know, you know, to get a, a reliable sample, you need to get something, you want something representative of the population. It's really hard to get a representative sample. It's really hard just because, you know, like how, what often we have to do is like polling organizations and uh, public opinion organizations, they call people, you know, you get this random phone call. And then they say, hey, you want to take 10 minutes to answer a survey? And everybody goes, no. And then, and you don't, right? And then, and then there's going to be like every so often somebody goes, yeah, I will tell you all of my thoughts and opinions about everything, right? And you just go, oh, I, I wish I didn't start this conversation. <laughs> but um, um, you, who responds to the survey isn't necessarily who, what the general population looks like, right? Um, and so the, the answers you get might not be uh, representative of the population just by the very nature of, you know, not everybody wants to express their, their thoughts. And those who, who are might not be re reflective of the population. Yeah? Well, because we don't have a better... Because we, we haven't read mind-reading technology yet. Yeah? <laughs> or... You know, there's also privacy laws, right? right? Perhaps we would get a better opinion or better idea if we could search everybody's like browser history and be like, oh, what are you looking up online? And then we'll know like how you feel. But I think people would have issues with that. But probably, <laughs> probably Google knows more about public opinion and uh, and people's habits than uh, than other things. But yeah. Um, the only way I can get information from you is by talking to you. And, you know, everybody has their, thankfully, everybody has a filter, should be, of like what happens in your brain and what comes out of your mouth. And, and, and because everybody's got a filter, like what comes out of your mouth might not necessarily be like your true feelings about certain things, right? And so, um, uh, but anyway. Okay, so one method that should, so, so this is always something that we just gloss over, right? We, in, uh, in your textbooks, the problems just go, oh, we got a random sample of 80 people, and these are their thoughts. And we go, oh, okay, that's great. But that was actually really, really hard to do. Um, but one method that should produce represented samples is random sampling, but it's not guaranteed 
to produce random samples. It's it's random, right? We're not guaranteed anything. So, uh, oh, okay. Let me give you your first view quiz answer for today, and it's the letter E. E as an elephant. E as an elephant. Okay. And so when we do random sampling, though, so now we're going to just pretend like random sampling exists and works and we're able to do it because if we don't at least pretend we have this ideal scenario, you know, we, we, the, the math all breaks down. Um, so that's, there's, a, there's a disconnect between the reality and what we're hoping for. But, I mean, that's, that's the same with everything, right? In engineering and stuff, there's, always, there's a disconnect. So you, just, you have these multiply by a factor of six and stuff. But um, uh, so anyway, what we do is you know, we take a random sample of data from the population. From your sample, you calculate the mean or the proportion or something. And because that sampling process is random, if someone else were to have the same question, follow the same process, and get another random sample, they're going to end up getting different people in their sample. They're going to end up getting a different sample mean. Okay? And um, but what we would expect is that their sample mean is kind of close to your sample mean. Right? We would be surprised if their sample mean was like wildly different from your sample mean. Okay? So, so we're going to write some values of the sample mean are more likely, some values are going to be less likely. The distribution of all possible values of the sample mean from all possible random samples, this is known as the sampling distribution of the mean. And so to kind of illustrate this, um, I'm going to say let's pretend we have some hypothetical population. And uh, we'll just, just to keep it simple, we'll say it's a normal distribution has a mean of zero, standard deviation one. So basically the Z distribution. We're going to pretend our population has a Z distribution. And we're going to draw a random sample from this population. We'll calculate the mean of the sample. Then what we're going to do is we're going to draw another random sample from the population and calculate the mean of the, this other sample. And we're going to repeat this every single time. Draw a random sample, calculate the mean. Draw a random sample, calculate the mean. Draw a random sample, calculate the mean. We're going to keep track of every single sample mean from every single random sample we draw. And then I'm going to just build a, a histogram of all of the different sample means that, that I get. OK, we're going to look at the distribution of the sample mean. And now we invoke the central limit theorem. And we said, if the sampling size is large enough, then the sampling distribution of the mean is going to follow a normal distribution and this normal distribution will have standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of n. So here is the population centered at 0, standard deviation 1. And these are some of the values that I've drawn. I've rounded them off to two decimal places. So I got negative 2.21, negative 0.84, negative 0.82, negative 0.63. And this is called a rug plot, so it shows all the dots that I've drawn, and uh, and I think my face is covering uh, the last three values, which look like 1.1 and 1.4 and 1.51 or something like that. Okay, but uh, but all of these values are here. We calculate what is the mean of all of these values, and I get 0 0.092, and that's this red line. So it's a little bit above zero, but but not dramatically so. Here's another uh, random sample. Okay. Another random sample, so you can see the dots that show up on the rug plot are, a little, are different. This time I got negative 2.31, negative 1.13. But when I calculate the mean here, I got 0 0.096, so just ever so slightly different from my previous one. Here's another random sample, um, and here the, the values are different, and my mean here is negative 1.197. Here my mean is 0.426. Here my mean is negative 0.176, and so th these are just different random samples, okay? And now I'm just going to run a loop, and I'm going to say, just do this 10,000 times. Every single time I'm going to draw 16 values from the normal distribution, so we're using our norm, and then I'm going to calculate the mean of this, and I'm going to store it inside this vector, okay? 
And then so after doing this 10,000 times, I say, hey, what is the mean of all of these sample means? And I get something very close to zero. What's the standard deviation of all of these sample means? I get something very close to 0.25, basically. The, the standard deviation of the population was 1, square root of 16 is 4, so I get something very close to 1 fourth. And if I create a histogram, this is a histogram of all of the sample means. This is after 10,000 of them. I get something that looks uh, very much like the normal distribution. And if I were to do infinitely many of these things, I would get the normal distribution. But after 10,000, we just have something that's approximately like the normal distribution. And we can see the standard deviation is a lot smaller, right? This um, we have a standard deviation of 0.25, and so we see you know 95% between 0.5 and negative 0.5, and pretty much 99.7% between negative 0.75 and positive 0.75. So almost all the values. So this is what we get. If you do a QQ norm, you get pretty much a straight line. So it indeed it looks like the normal distribution. And uh, and that's that. So yeah, we say. Um, as long as the sample is large enough, the central limit theorem says the mean of the random sample comes from a normal distribution centered at mu, the population mean, with a standard deviation of sigma divided by the square root of n. Sigma over the square root, square root of n, we call that the standard error, or basically the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is known as the standard error. And this is going to shrink because n is in the denominator. As the sample size goes up, your standard error shrinks, right? And basically the variance, how much one sample mean varies to another sample mean, um, that, that amount of variance from one sample mean to another sample mean gets smaller if your samples get bigger. And, and I think that makes intuitive sense. If you, if you have really small samples, like if you're only going to select two people and you calculate the mean of those two people, you could get end up getting, just by random chance, two people with very high values, two people with very low values. And that, that is not that unusual to imagine. But um, if you have 100 people, it would be hard to imagine that all 100 people have very high values or all 100 people have very low values. And so for the, the mean of your big sample to vary it is going to be a lot harder to do. Because if it, especially if it's a random sample and you calculate the mean of those um, 100 people, uh, it's probably going to look closer to like the, uh, the general population. Okay, uh, let me give you another view quiz answer. Second view quiz answer today will be C, C as in cat. C as in cat. C. Okay, so we pair this. The central limit theorem says it follows the normal distribution. Okay? Normal distribution says, okay, 95% of the time, your random value is going to be within two standard deviations of the mean. So when I draw a random sample, there's a 95% probability that the mean of the random sample is going to be within two standard deviations of the population mean. Okay? So 95% probability that the mean of the random sample is within two standard deviations of the population mean. So we take that statement and we flip it around, okay? So 95% of the time, when I draw a random sample, it's going to be within two standard deviations of the sample mean, of uh, the population mean, okay? So now, if I see a random value x bar, a random sample mean x bar, I could be 95% confident that the mean mu is within two standard deviations of x bar. Does that kind of make sense? Because the central limit theorem says 95% of the time, x bar is within two standard deviations of the mean population mean mu. So now if I see a value x bar, I can be 95% confident that mu is within two standard deviations of x bar. Okay, so kind of a, uh, a reverse uh, reasoning here, okay? Now, I do use the word confidence, and did anyone explain why we use, for this part I can talk about 95% probability that the sample will be, the mean will be within two standard deviations of the population mean, but over here I have to say I'm 
I'm 95% confident that the population mean is within two standard deviations of the sample mean. We can't say probability, yeah. So because when you create a population mean, it is, uh, and you want to share, it is Right. The the population mean is either inside your confidence interval or it's not. It's uh the population mean is not subject to randomness or uncertainty, right? So probability only makes sense when you talk about uncertain events. Do any of you have a coin? All right, pretend I've got All right, just imagine I have a quarter here, okay? All right, now before I flip the quarter, I'm going to say, what's the probability it lands heads? And you say 50%, okay? All right, here, let's, uh, I need something to flip. Okay. Okay, all right, flip the coin. Just, just, just from your desk, you can just... Okay, so we ask, what's the probability that the coin's gonna land heads? We say 50%. Okay, now go ahead and flip it. Okay, and now we say, what... <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Now we ask, what is the probability that it landed heads? And what's your answer? What's the probability it landed heads? Okay, all right, now go ahead and look at it. All right, now cover it up. Oh, no, oh, oh, oh. It's all right, it's all right, all right. Okay, so, well, the, 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 tr the, it was a tr the second question when I said, what's the probability it landed heads? That was actually, it's a nonsense question. Once the coin has landed, there's no probability. You can't ask, what's the probability it landed heads? That either landed heads or it didn't land heads. Um, so it's, it's nonsense to ask, what's the probability it landed heads? But what you can say, is I'm 50% confident that it landed heads. You can say I'm 50% confident that it landed heads. Okay, at least that's the frequentist view of probability. Now, if you talk about Bayesian probability, Bayesian probability just reflects your personal beliefs, and, and it would be reasonable to say there's a 50% Bayesian probability that the coin landed heads. And um, now that, it feels a little bit weird for that example, but, um, but in other contexts it makes more sense. So anyway, that's why we use the word confidence, and then we say, okay, well, um, we're, we're confident that the population mean is within about two standard errors of the, of the, um, of the sample mean x bar. Now, in order to do this, we have to use sigma over the square root of n, but we don't know sigma over the square root of n, so we use s over the square root of n, and when you do that, it invokes extra uncertainty, and so we fix that by using the t-distribution, which is like a heavier-tailed version of the normal distribution. So, I don't know, anyway, this is all, this is all part of the story, right? Did you learn about Guinness Brewery and the t-distribution? And uh, so the, the, the person who invented the t-distribution, William Gossett, was a quality control engineer at Guinness Brewery and yeah anyway it figured this out okay um, on the other side we have hypothesis testing okay and we imagine this hypothetical population with a hypothetical mean and a hypothetical standard deviation so we imagine kind of all of these hypothetical things uh, if we assume this hypothesis is true right and, and what we do is we say, all right, in this imaginary hypothetical world, what would our calculations be? Okay, what would the prob probabilities be? What's the probability I would get this random sample? And, and things like that. We make a bunch of assumptions and we do our calculations based on that. And, and so uh, just kind of as an example, we'll do a t-test where we're comparing two independent samples and your null hypothesis, um, well, the, the test is if I take one sample and, uh, and I take another sample from two different populations, based on what I see in my sample, does this provide evidence that the two populations 
have the same mean. Okay, so um, we could say, you know, if, if we go to a second grade classroom and we measure how tall the boys are and how tall the girls are in the second grade classroom, um, do the populations of second grade boys and second grade girls have different heights or at, at, sec, at age, uh, whatever, in second grade, are boys and girls on average the same height? You know, this, this is a question that we could ask. Um, and, and so the null hypothesis would be that there's no significant difference between the means of the specified populations. That if we go to the population and we looked at all second grade boys and all second grade girls, we're going to have the same mean. Okay? And if this null hypothesis were true, then when you look at your actual sample of data and you get values that aren't exactly the same, we're going to say, you know, any difference we observe, that's just because of random sampling. That our random sample of boys and our random sample of girls just happen to have a different average. But if we were to look at the entire population of, of all the boys and the entire population of all the girls, we would have the same um, we would have the same average, okay? We would look at the entire population. And then and the p-value, the, the definition of the p-value is the probability of observing our data or something more extreme or more unusual, but we, the probability is calculated under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, under the assumption that these two populations have the same mean or whatever else the null hypothesis is stating. So, you know, we start off, we imagine two hypothetical populations with the same mean. In this hypothetical situation, when we take random samples from each population, we would expect both samples to have sample means that are approximately equal, right? So population one has, you know, some mean 10. Population two has some mean also 10. I take a random sample from population one. I might not get exactly 10. Maybe I'll get 9.8. I take a random sample from population 2, I might not get exactly 10, maybe I get 10.1. Okay, We would expect these two things, 9.8 versus 10.1, to be approximately equal. But what if, um, and if they're not equal, right, we get 9.8 versus 10.1, we want to know, is that difference, you know, 0 0.3, is that significantly different from 0, right? We're expecting a difference of 0, we're getting something that's not 0, is that difference significant? Okay. And so we're going to find, find the p-value. If the two populations had means that were equal, meaning the null hypothesis were true, what's the probability that just from random sampling we would get these two samples where the difference between the sample means is equal to or greater than the one we observed? So here, uh, let's say we got one sample, the mean is 10, the other sample is 12.5. Is this difference of 2.5 10 versus 12.5, is that uh, difference, I should say 2.5, significant? And, and the answer is it depends, right? Depends on the standard error. If the standard error is really small, like all of the values in sample 1 are very close to 10 and all of the values in sample 2 are all very close to 12.5, this difference of 2.5 is, is probably significant. Maybe it's like five times bigger than the standard error, okay? On the other hand, if if you got a lot of variation from in sample one, right? In sample one, you got values as small as three and values as big as 18 or things like that. Like, oh, you know what? You got an average of 10. Over here, you get values as small as three and values as big as 19 or something. And you got an average of 12.5. We go, oh, you know what? This difference of 2.5, it's not that big of a deal, okay? This, this is definitely within our kind of our, our tolerance of just uh, ra random sampling. So, so it depends, right? And, um, and so when you do your p-value calculations, you say, what's the probability of getting the data that we have, or something more extreme, so in our case we got a difference of 2.5, what's the probability we get a difference of 2.5 if the null hypothesis were true? We compare our p-value to just some arbitrary significance level alpha to decide if our p-value is big or small, and if it's small, if the p-value is small, it says, yeah, you know, um, it, it's unlikely to see these results 
if the only source of variation is random chance. So we're, we're not saying it's impossible, but it's very unlikely, right? It's kind of like you flip a coin 30 times and it landed heads three times out of 30. We go, if, if that happened, you'd suspect something's wrong with your coin or somebody's cheating or something, right? Because, I mean, is it possible to flip a coin 30 times and you get heads only three times out of 30 by random chance? It's possible, but again, I mean, it's we don't want to say 0% probability. It's not impossible, but it's very small probability, okay? And so the fact that this happened, right? But we did see these super unlikely results, and rather than presuming that we were just super lucky, like somehow by magical chance, super lucky chance, we got only three heads out of 30 flips, rather we we conclude something other than random chance is responsible for the data we observe. Something other than random chance, like maybe the coin is, uh, um, something's wrong with it, somebody's cheating when they're flipping the coin. And so we're gonna reject the null. We come to the conclusion, this wasn't the result of random chance, it was the result of something else, okay? On the other hand, if the p-value is large, it means our data is not unlikely to occur even when the only source of variation is random chance. So if you flip the coin 30 times, let's say you get 17 heads out of 30, okay? Now, according to probability, we would expect 15 out of 30 to be heads, and then we got 17 out of 30, and we go, oh, that's more than what I expected. Maybe maybe somebody's cheating with the coin, but we go, oh, you know what, it's not that weird. 17 out of 30 is not that unusual, okay? And um, that kind of thing could happen just by random chance. Now. It's possible that the coin actually is unfair and somebody is cheating, and that's why we got 17 heads out of 30, but it's also, it's not enough data for us to come to the conclusion that definitely somebody's cheating. So um, we're just saying, hey, you know what, we're not going to eliminate the possibility that our, our data is just a result of random chance, so we're not going to re reject the null hypothesis. And that's kind of the reasoning we have when we talk about p-values. Um, pretty much all of the hypothesis tests that you would have done in your intro stats class uh, is based off of, you know, the central limit theorem, mathematical ideas. You probably had to prove these things in 100B, um, and we're, we're assuming these things follow the normal distribution. Um, what we're going to do next and next week will be randomization tests, and we're going to we're not going to rely on the central limit theorem. We're just going to use randomization to kind of come up with our sampling distributions. Okay, and they're going to be designed around this um, assumption of exchangeability. How many of you quiz answers have I given you? Two. 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 And what time is it? 10.44. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and give you your third view quiz answer, which is B. B as in bear. Third view quiz answer. All right. Um, I got a bunch of slides on data collection, which uh, is is important. This is, this is just some silly example. Okay. And, uh, and we just said, uh, suppose a dentist wants to know if a daily dose of vitamin C will result in fewer canker sores in the mouth than taking no vitamin C. All right, so this is just some weird question that we've got. All right, and so the dentist working through the local dental society convinces all the dental patients in town uh, with appointments in the first two weeks in December to be subjects of a study he divides them into two groups, those who normally take 500 milligrams of vitamin C and those who don't. He asks them how often they have canker sores, checks their dental records. He compares the proportion of those who take vitamin C and have canker sores and those who don't take vitamin C and have canker sores. And they find there is, uh, okay, there is a significant difference, get rid of that suffix there, uh, in the two populations with you know, those who take vitamin C have have a smaller proportion. All right, so what can we conclude here? Well, the issue is this is not a random sample, okay? Because we're looking at those who have appointments in the first two weeks in December. So we're not able to do anything and make a large conclusion about the larger population. Now, we have to, if we wanted to, we would have to assume those who have appointments in the first two weeks of December are re representative of the general population. And, and maybe that's a reasonable assumption, maybe not. I don't know, okay? Study was also observational, right? We didn't assign treatments. We just said, hey, do you take vitamin C? Yes or no, right? And, uh, 
and that's that's going to be self-selective. People who take you know multivitamin supplements or you know vitamin C supplements or just some kind of supplement is not necessarily going to be like people who don't, right? So people who per spend money on supplements and stuff like that will will have distinct thoughts and feelings than those who, who don't and, and who knows, right? Um, so we can't make any kind of ca cause and effect um, conclusions, at least from a classical standpoint. And so all we can say is just for these patients, those who take vitamin C have fewer canker sores than those who don't. We don't know why. We can't attribute a cause and effect, and we don't know if this would be consistent with another group. Okay, uh, same thing. We look at the first two weeks of December. We randomly assign patients, and we say some of you have to take vitamin C, and some of you are not allowed to take vitamin C, right? <laughs> you have to, you know, you have to eat oranges or you'll get scurvy, but, um, you know, we're going to, some of them, they take vitamin C, and some are required to abstain, and then we, uh, we look at the difference, there's a difference, okay? Again, not a random sample, so we can't generalize to a larger population, but this time, because we randomly assigned the, the treatments to the subjects, assuming everything else is um, kind of controlled for or randomized, then the difference in the two proportions can be attributed to the vitamin C, okay? We don't know if this would be consistent with a larger group. We don't want to generalize to the larger population, and thus we feel very confident that our sample is representative of the population. But at least for this group, we, we think we know why the, the results are different. Okay, and I, I, the rest of them are kind of like this. If we have a random sample, of, I think we got a random sample of dental patients, not just those in the first two weeks of December, okay, and then this is the observational study. We didn't assign who takes vitamin C and who doesn't, okay? So because we have a random sample, we can kind of generalize to the larger population of all dental patients, okay? Because we got a random sample of dental patients, so we're gonna generalize to all dental patients in the town. Observational study, so we're not gonna make a cause and effect conclusion, okay? There could be some kind of confounding um, variable, all right? Um, we can't generalize to the, uh, to the entire general population just because this was a sample of dental patients, but maybe if the dental patients are representative of all dental patients in general or something, maybe we can uh, make some kind of inference, right? So we have to be careful about what our sample is representative of and who we're generalizing to. Okay, and, and this is kind of the, the fictional imaginary scenario where we have a random sample and we have random assignment. And in this case, we can generalize to the entire population. We can also make a conclusion about cause and effect. Okay, and that's, that's this what wall of text is basically saying. All right. Um, the problem is this last scenario where we have random samples and random assignment this is like never possible in real life, okay? Because uh, anytime you do an experiment with random assignment, that requires patient consent, okay? And basically as soon as somebody declines and says, you know what, I don't want to participate, this is no longer a random sample, right? So if you, you know, you're doing some kind of vaccine trial, somebody's gonna say, I don't want this, okay? And now, now it's no longer a random sample, okay? Now, now, we might be able to say, hey, you know what? Even though it's not a random sample, this sample that we're working with, at least with respect to a bunch of other stuff, we can expect to be representative, okay? And, and if we can expect it to be representative, maybe we can generalize. But if it's, uh, you know, especially if the, uh, the thing is, uh, not going to be representative, you know, especially if you're doing some kind of experiment and then question, you're asking questions about, um, I don't know, their, you know, opinions about this and that, that it, it might not be, it's probably not going to be representative, right? So, um, so often you're either dealing in a scenario where you have random sampling or you're dealing with a scenario where you have random assignment, but rarely do you have both. 
Okay, I mean, we'd like to imagine some fictional scenario where you have both, but um, but rarely do you do you have the case. Um, okay, uh, that's it. That's it for today. Um, so that's your review of stats ten, and um, and and starting next week we'll do, do do randomization tests, bootstrap, and things like that. All right, well have a good weekend. We'll see you week nine. And uh, yeah, see you there.